Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Deborah Cobray. We are at Freedom for Our Future, and we are, the Lord instructed us to, as we step away and as we begin to pass this to the next generation, that this church is a multi-generational as well as a multi it's multi-everything, multicultural, multi-generational, and God said he wanted us to believe to hand this over free and clear. And so we have a campaign, Freedom for Our Future, to pay this church off free and clear. And in the freedoms, we, we found that God had instructed us that there's four things really that we need to look at. Number one, there is freedom from financial institutions because the borrower is slave to the lender. We spend $87,000 or $86,000 a month on interest, and how, how ridiculous that is when we could actually be using that for ministry. So freedom from financial institutions. So no one can take this away from us. No one can sell it to a mosque or anything else. This will belong to the church until Jesus comes. Amen. Freedom for the next generation because we don't want to saddle them with debt. My generation, the boomers, have made some very poor choices and there is uh, extreme debt in our nation right now. We are headed towards a financial cliff in the natural. But I've got good news for you because we're not in the natural. We're in the kingdom of God and in the spirit and God's got a plan for his people if we'll listen. Freedom for more ministry because all of that Additional finance will allow us to expand our missions programs and our outreach programs and everything that we'd like to do. Iglesia La Roca, we want to build them a beautiful chapel. And there's so many things in the heart of this church. And then the last, of course, was freedom for our hearts. Because God says that no man can serve two masters. You will either love one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And money is a servant, but money is attached to mammon, and mammon can be a god in our lives. It tells us where we're going to go, how we're going to live, what kind of vacations we're going to have, and what's going to determine our futures, money. And God is a very jealous God, and he doesn't want me sharing my heart with anything but him. And therefore, when I begin to learn how to give, it actually takes the power of that selfishness and that fear, and it begins to chip it away from my heart, and my heart gets free because God loves a generous giver, and God is a giver. And when he begins to teach you the principles of giving and finances, you realize that God isn't broke, he doesn't want his people broke, and that there is a way through that is excellent and appropriate and wonderful. And so that's where we're at right now. And tonight I want to look at a message, and it's found in the 26th chapter of Genesis. And it's a message about freedom in the midst of, or what's the title of this message? It's actually called God's Economic Recovery in Hard Times. And we've had a recession for the last seven years. And they say it's over, but I'm wondering, is anybody better off than they were? There's a new normal out there, isn't there? And even though they say that there is a slow recovery happening, it hasn't happened in our city, and we are all still treading water and believing God. Am I the only one? So I love this. This is a signature message. God, I've preached this before. Jim and I live on this. I live on this. I meditate on it all the time. And so I want to give you five principles tonight, and I'm going to go very quickly, and I'm going to look at the life of Isaac in Genesis chapter 26, because Isaac was in a situation very similar to ours. Isaac was in a hard place. He was in a hard time, and he was in a drought. And Isaac didn't know what to do to survive. Now, in the agrarian cultures of the, of the Middle East and in the ancient times, if you didn't have water, you didn't have crops. If you didn't have crops, you didn't have food. If you didn't have water, you couldn't water your stock and your livestock. And if you didn't have livestock, you didn't have milk, you didn't have meat, you didn't have things to wear. So everything was determined and dependent upon the rain. When there was drought, that would be equivalent to you and I in a severe recession or a depression. There was nothing happening and there was no hope of it. So I want you to keep that in mind as we look at what's happening in Isaac's life. So Isaac's married to a woman named Rebecca. They have two sons, Esau and Jacob. Isaac is the miracle son of Abraham and Sarah. He was born when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 years old. And here we see Isaac now as a grown man in verse 1 of chapter 26. And it says, there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. 
And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. So Isaac is in this place, Gerar. He is in the promised land. He's in the place where God told him to be. It's in the place where God said, I'm giving this land to Abraham. He said, I'm giving this land to Isaac, to Jacob, and to all of your posterity. And so now there's a famine. Right now, it belongs to the Philistines, but one day it will become the nation of Israel. And Gerar is about 39 miles from, from some very familiar cities in Jerusalem and Jeru or in, in Israel. And Jerusalem is about 60 miles from here. But Jerusalem isn't even a city yet. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. So his father had a drought, and his father went down to Egypt when there was a drought. And God's saying to, to Isaac, Don't follow in your father's footsteps. Don't go down to Egypt because there's water. The Nile is running. There's crops there. But I don't want you to go there. This is what he says. Verse 3. Dwell in the land, and I will be with you and bless you. I will give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply and as the stars of heaven, I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So God appears to Isaac. God says to Isaac, don't go to Egypt. Even though there's water and there's hope there, I want you to stay in this drought-ridden, dusty, dry land. This land that I have promised to you, to your descendants, and to your father Abraham. I want you to stay in this hard place. So God doesn't let him go to an easier place. So in the midst of hard times, God loves to show himself strong on behalf of of a very weak situation for his people. God wants to shine great light in the midst of great darkness. God does his best work in our hardest times. So God says, Isaac, don't leave, stay there. I want to bless you. Now the word bless means the power to succeed. So God says to Isaac, you are the covenant son. You are the son of the promise. I have given you the power to succeed. I want to bless you and I'm going to bless you in this very difficult place. Verse Six. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. So Isaac stays there. Let's move on. And the men of the place asked him about his wife. And he said, she's my sister, for he was afraid to say she's my wife, because he thought, lest the men of the place kill me for Rebekah, because she's beautiful to behold. Now it came to pass when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw them. And there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously, she's your wife. So how could you say she's my sister? Isaac said, because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, what is this that you've done? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife and you should have brought guilt on us all. So here's the story. God says to Isaac, don't go to Egypt. Don't go to the obvious place where there is blessing and water. Stay in this drought ridden hard land. I want to bless you in a hard place. Then Isaac stays there, but Isaac does something. So let me just, there's five quick things I'm going to give you. Number one, if I'm going to see God's economic recovery plan in my life in a difficult place, I'm going to have to realize I'm an heir and I'm blessed in the hard places. You are going to walk through times where you're going to have great abundance and great wonderful joy. And then there are going to be times in your life and in your journey and in your seasons where there's going to be dry times. You're going to feel like a fish out of water. You're going to not know what to do. You're going to wonder where God is and things are going to dry up in your life. It's times and seasons and life is made up of times and seasons. And God says in the dry places, in the seasons of drought, I don't want you leaving the blessed land where I can bless you and I can show myself strong on your behalf. I want you to stay put. So the first thing when you encounter a hard place or a hard time in your life is understand that you are an heir of God and blessed. God spoke a direct word to Isaac. Romans 10, 17 says, now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When God speaks a word to us, faith comes. Faith comes when the will of God is known. 
The just shall live by faith. God has not called me to live in fear. He's not called me to live in unbelief. He's not called me to live in doubt. He's not called me to live in frivolity. He's not called me to live in foolishness. He's called me as a daughter of the king to live by faith. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. Therefore, when you sit in this service, when you open your Bibles, when you hear Pastor Jim, Pastor Luke, Pastor Dam, when you turn on your televisions, you listen to other great Bible teachers, and the Word of God is beginning to be preached to you, and something quickens in your heart. Faith is coming to your heart, and God is speaking to you, and God is saying to you, and when God speaks, faith rises in the heart of the believer, because God has given to us the measure of faith, and it is there to grow when the Word of God is heard by our spirit hearts. Are you hearing me? Isaac heard God. God said, Isaac, I'm going to bless you. You belong to me. Well, what about, what does God say to the church? How about this, that we are joint heirs with Jesus? How about this one, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? What does Galatians chapter 3 tell us? How about this one, Galatians 3, 26 through 29? For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Everything that God has promised Jesus, everything that God promised Abraham, the seed of Abraham was Isaac, and through Isaac came the Messiah, and Jesus is the seed, and all the promises of God are yes and amen in him, and in Christ Jesus, every promise of God is fulfilled when the body of Christ that is in Christ begins to rise up and take hold of that promise and say, it's for me, I believe it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to stay in a hard place, I'm not going to be afraid, I'm not not going to doubt. God, you said it. I believe it. Therefore, it settles it because we are believers. That is what we do, and that is who we are. We are heirs of God in Christ Jesus. And God says, if I say you are blessed, then you are blessed. If I say you have the power to succeed, then church of the living God in the 21st century, regardless of what comes your way, regardless of what you face, regardless of what comes down the pike, you have God's given ability to do whatever he needs you to do when you need to do it because you are an heir of Jesus Christ, just as much as Isaac was the son of the covenant promised man, Abraham himself. Therefore, number one, in a hard place, I'm going to have to listen and realize I'm an heir, and God's given me the power to succeed in a drought, in a dry place, in a hard time, and when there's darkness around me, when I'm a fish out of water, that means nothing. What means everything is what God says we can do. And if he says we can do it, he gives us the power to do it, period. So number one. Number two, if I'm going to see God's economic recovery in a hard place, I'm going to have to stop living by fear and unbelief. Because Isaac, let's go back to chapter 26. Now it came to pass, verse 8. When he'd been there a long time, a long time, this wasn't just a little time, a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through the window, and he saw him kissing his wife or caressing his wife. He'd already said, she's my sister. He'd lied. I am not here to badmouth Isaac. He's probably listening through the portal of heaven. I don't know. I'm probably not that important. But I'm not here to badmouth Isaac, because if I'd have been Isaac, I probably would have done the same thing. I'm a stranger in a strange land. I am a white girl that has just moved into a multicultural neighborhood. I don't fit anywhere. I'm a black girl that's just moved into a white neighborhood. I'm a Hispanic that's just moved into a black neighborhood. I'm an Asian that's just moved into all the neighborhoods. I don't know. You know how we are. We get real uncomfortable when we're out of our zone, don't we? Can we just be honest here? So here's Isaac. He doesn't belong to anybody but Abraham, and he is in the Philistines' land. He is the wrong tribe. He has no tribe. He doesn't belong to anybody. He is out of, he's a fish out of water, and he's afraid. And he's got this beauty queen that he has married, and he knows that these men are going to kill him because they want Rebecca. So he does what is natural for any probably normal red-blooded man to do. He lies his way out of the situation. 
and he lives a lie. Have any of us done that? Do not raise your hands. <laughs> of course we have. We have fudged on our taxes. We've smushed this, and we've done this, and we no, 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 that. We have. We're human, are we not? We have to learn how to be God's kids. We have to have our minds transformed, and that takes the ability to see the old nature and fear and unbelief and say, I'm not going to have any part of it because that will stop faith. Isaac got nothing done as long as he was living that lie. And it wasn't until he got caught in that lie. The Bible says it was a long time. And the Bible says that Isaac had been there a long time living this lie. And here he is caressing his sister. And Abimelech, the king, is seeing this and saying, this man is either one twisted mess or he is lying. And he calls him, he gets busted on it, and he has to fess up. You see, God's not going to let you stay in a lie for too long. God's not going to let us be in doubt and unbelief and in the flesh and in that old kingdom. Because there's two kingdoms here, and God's called me out of the kingdom of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of God. It's a whole different set of rules. And if I don't live by God's rules, by God's set of, of rules, by faith, then I'm back in that old kingdom of the flesh, and I lose over there. I have no power over there. Nothing happened in Isaac's life as long as he was in doubt and unbelief. Because it says here, in verse 10, and Abimelech said, what is this that you've done? And he gets mad at him. And Abimelech charges all his people in verse 11 and says, no one shall touch this man or his wife or they'll be put to death. So Abimelech, he protects Isaac. And verse 12, look at verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. Now, he'd been there a long time, hadn't he? Didn't the Bible say that? He'd been in doubt and unbelief, had he not? He'd been in the flesh, living in the flesh. He is a Christian, but he's living in the old nature and the old ways. Nothing's happening in his life. He's in a drought. He gets busted. He gets caught. So if you are in trouble right now, maybe God's just busting you out of that doubt and unbelief and those, those little white lies you've been telling or whatever it is you're doing because God's got something better for you than the old nature and the old way. Because when you live in the flesh, when you live by your own resources, the only power you have is you. And that's pretty pitiful in a hard time, is it not? But you see, when I walk over here to where the king is, when I step into the kingdom of God and when I begin to live in the kingdom of God, then all of a sudden I've got all the resources of heaven at my disposal. And what I need and when I need it is going to happen because Isaac, nothing happened. But then it says Isaac sowed. Let's look at that verse again because there's a lot going on here. Now remember, there's a drought. Verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And he, verse 13. And he, the man, began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. So what is that saying? Number three, I'm going to have to do something if I want God to bless me. I'm going to have to, number one, realize I'm an heir and that God wants to bless me, give me the power to succeed in a hard place. Number two, I'm going to have to get out of fear and unbelief because that's going to stop what God wants to do. And number three, when I get out of fear and unbelief, then I'm back in faith and faith without works is dead. I'm going to have to do something. What did Isaac do? There was a dry field. It was a drought. There was no water. So Isaac had to take his seed and he had to take his plow and he had to go plow up a bunch of dusty, dry, land and look like an absolute fool where nothing is growing and nothing is happening because there is no rain. Hello. And yet Isaac is sowing in a dry, dusty field that has no hope in the natural of bringing any kind of a return. But it says, and in that same year, Isaac sowed and reaped a hundredfold return. And the man began to become prosperous and continued to prosper until he became very prosperous. It was a process that God wanted to bless him in, but he had to do something to get it going. First, he had to get out of doubt and unbelief. He had to get out of the flesh and get in the spirit. And then he had to do something. Nothing just happens. God does not drop golden eggs from golden geese in our backyards. I have looked. They don't come. 
He had to plow and dry fields. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. George Mueller stated that, and George managed to feed 2,000 orphans every day until he died in England. Let me read it again. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. If you can do it, God doesn't need to step in. Faith begins where man's power ends. George Mueller. Augustine said, faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we believe. Faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of faith is to see what we have believed. The world says, I'll believe it when I see it. God's people says, I believe it, and then I will see it. I love what, I love what, uh, William Booth said, the founder of the Salvation Army, he says, faith and works travel side by side. He founded the Salvation Army, and the Salvation Army is still going 200 years later. Maybe it's not quite that long, about 180 years later. Something's going on there. Faith and works should travel side by side, step answering to step, like the legs of men walking. First faith and then works, and then faith again, and then works again until they can scarcely distinguish which is the one and which is the other. Faith and works, faith and works, faith and works. I believe, therefore I'm doing something. I believe, therefore I'm doing something. I believe, therefore I'm building a house when nobody's building houses and you can't sell anything. I believe, therefore I'm going to plow in a dry, dusty field when nothing's growing. I believe, God, therefore I'm believing you, God. You said, God, you said, God, I'm putting you to the test, God. You said your word says you told me I believe I'm releasing my faith by my works you see obedience is the proof of faith just like disobedience is the proof of unbelief when you don't believe you don't obey when you believe you do something so number one I'm gonna have to realize I'm an heir and blessed Number two, I'm going to have to stop living by fear and unbelief. Number three, I'm going to have to do something. Noah had to build an ark before he'd ever seen any rain. My goodness. Elijah had to go to the widow of Zarephath in the city of Sidon in Jezebel's country. The city of, Zer of, of, the city of Zarephath was where Jezebel's father was the king. God sent Elijah the prophet to a place to get resource and food that was right under the very nose of the enemy. And he sent him to a destitute widow that had no food left, and she was about to die. Now, if that's not enough to say, really, God, what is? And yet that's where God sent him because God was proving that God steps in to the impossible situations. When he says you can do it, when he says you can have it, when he says believe me and I'll show myself strong, then we're gonna have to plow in a dry field. We're gonna have to go to Zarephath and talk to a widow. We're gonna have to build an ark when we've never seen any rain. We're gonna have to do what the heroes of faith did in Hebrews chapter 11. The church of the 21st century is gonna have to get up and believe God like we've never believed God before. Number, th number four, faith travels, so do something. Number four, keep doing the right thing the right way because Isaac began to become prosperous. Then he continued to be prosperous, and then he was prosperous. He got so rich that they got jealous and kicked him out of Gerar. Now, when God blesses you, people are going to talk, and you're going to get persecuted. So let's just see that, can we? We've got five more minutes. Are you all right with me? We haven't talked very long here, about 25 minutes. And if I get excited, you know, you're just going to have to forgive me. I don't get to preach very much anymore. I'm just excited about this stuff, so I'll try to calm down. I will try to calm down. But remember, I'm old now, so you have to give me a lot of license. Genesis 26, verse 15, verse 14. For he had possessions of flocks. Verse 13 says a man began to prosper, continued prospering until he became very prosperous. I love that. Folks, it's a process. God wants to bless his people. He needs to bless us because he needs to get the kingdom done. He needs work done. It's got to be financed. Somebody's got to make some money. And somebody's got to make some money that's not going to hoard it. It's not how much of my money I'm going to give to God. You see, when you finally get this, it's how much of God's money I'm going to keep. Because it all belongs to him. 
Everything belongs to him. A thousand cattle on a thousand hill. The breath in my lungs belong to him. I can't keep myself alive for five minutes. Everything I have, he has given me. So it's not how much of my money I'm giving to God. It's really how much of God's money am I going to keep from me? Hello. See, if we get this, if we actually get this, if the penny actually drops, the things of the world grow strangely dim, and we actually are now on assignment and supernatural assignment, and actually the kingdom prospers and God can get done what he needs to get done because there's a generation that's actually on the earth that gets this and says, God, not for me, but for you. Your cause, your will, your way, good for you, good for others, good for me, God. It's not my money, it's yours. It's not how much of my money I'm giving to you, it's how much of your money I'm going to keep. Let's get this show on the road. Let's get this done. Begins, continues, and you become prosperous. Jim Cobray, I'm preaching to us. In our old age, may God be able to trust us with something so that we can accomplish something before we go home. We've done wonderful things, and God's been good to us. But we're not finished yet. There's a world to reach for Jesus Christ. There are nations that don't know him. There are languages that have yet to be translated into the word of God. There is so much work to be done. And the Lord is on his way. He is coming soon. And we've got to get to this church. So this is what happens. In verse 14, he had possessions of flocks and possession of herds and great numbers of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, and they had filled them with earth. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So he kicks Isaac out of Gerar. He says, you can't stay here anymore. They were jealous of him. He had to leave. He left about 40 miles, and he went into the valley. And Isaac departed from there, and he pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar, and he dwelt there. So now he's been kicked out because he's too wealthy. God has blessed him too much. And in verse 18, it says, And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he called them by the names which his father had dug them. Abraham had dug these wells before, and the Philistines came in as an act of war and filled them up so they couldn't be used. So Isaac goes back to where his father lived. And Isaac's servants dug in the valley, and they found a well of running water. Remember, water is everything. Without water, nothing lives, nothing grows. There is no money. Are you with me? So water is everything here. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac, which means quarreling, arguing. So Isaac's men dig a well. And here come Abimelech's men, and they quarrel with him, and they steal that well. So Isaac leaves that well. He calls that well his sack. It means to press and to quarrel. In other words, there's problem. There's pressure. People are coming against you. You're doing the right thing. And here's wrong coming at you. So Isaac's men go and they dig another well. Now let's see what happens here. And Isaac's men dug in the valley and found a well of running water. In verse 21, and they dug another well and they quarreled over that one. And so he called its name Sitna. The word Sitna means enmity. It means to oppose and accuse. Now here comes Abimelech's men and they are blaming and they are opposing and they are persecuting and they're stealing another well that belongs to Isaac. When you begin to prosper, you will have persecution. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but be of a good chair because I've overcome this world. But don't think that this is going to be easy. Don't think that you're just going to do something and it's just going to fall into your lap like a goose with golden eggs. You are going to be fighting tooth and nail for every piece of ground that you take for the kingdom of God. But it's how you fight that determines what you will take away with you. So here comes the world again, the old nature, the flesh, the old kingdom. Here comes arguing. Here comes quarreling. Here comes stealing. What does Isaac do? He backs away. He says, you can have the well. He goes and he digs another well. Here comes accusations. Here comes persecution. Here comes blaming. What does Isaac do? He fights for the well. He says, oh, no, I gave you one, but you can't have this one. No, he backs away. He gives him the well. His servants dig well number three. Let's see what happens. And he moved from there, verse 22, and he dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in this land. 
And that word means to be spacious and to be wide. He names these wells. So what is the point? Keep doing the right thing the right way for as long as it takes. Because you'll have opposition. You'll have people coming against you. You'll have people stealing from you. You'll have people copying what you've done. You'll have people lying about you. You'll have people blaming you. You'll have people accusing you. Get, you get a promotion at work. Somebody's not going to be happy about it. And boom, all of a sudden, hell comes at you. You better believe it. But it's how you fight against hell that's going to determine what ground you're going to take. If you get into the fray in the flesh, if you get angry, if you try to defend yourself, if you start accusing, if you start defending, if you start suing, if you start doing all of these things, all of a sudden, now you're back to that old kingdom and you're in your own resources and you are bound by only the power of this fallen world. Or you can step away and you can say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And God will get you to the place where he finds a well for you that belongs to you exclusively, that no one can touch and no one can take. Rehoboth. And it's called spacious. It's called beautiful. And it's that place that God's called you to. And you can take that place because you fought well and you fought the way of the kingdom. So how does God overcome in economic times? Well, I've got to understand it and I've got to realize, number one, I'm an heir. And what God says is true. Number two, I'm going to have to do something. Or number two, I'm going to have to stop living by fear and unbelief. I can't, I can't take anything in the flesh. Nothing. The flesh will not absolutely get anything from the kingdom of God. You can get nothing from the kingdom of God when you operate in the flesh. It just doesn't work. You have to stay in the spirit. So number three, I'm going to do something. Faith without works is dead. I'm going to have to believe God again and do something. Yeah, it means working hard. It means plowing in a drought. It means dry, dusty ground. It means people looking at you like you've lost your mind. Yes, it means all of that. But you know what? You've got a word from God. And he says, I've given you the power to succeed and I'm going to bless you in this hard place. Just keep at it. Number th four, I'm going to have to keep doing the right thing the right way for as long as it takes. But God, it's been so long. Yes, it has, but he's not done yet. And don't give up yet. Fight in the spirit, not in the flesh. The last one, number five, and we're done. Live up to your birthright. Bless others. Because this is what happens. Isaac is now in this spacious place. They're digging wells. They're finding water. His wealth is growing. And Abimelech, in verse 26, comes to him from Gerar with one of his friends and his commander of his army. And in verse 27, Isaac says to them, Why have you come to me since you hate me and you sent me away from you? But they said, We have certainly seen the Lord is with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you, and since we have done nothing to you but good, and have sent you away in peace, you are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made a feast, and they ate, and they drank, and Isaac cut a covenant with them, and he blessed them. Now, what they said to him wasn't true. They didn't bless him. They sent him away. They kicked him out of their city. They lied, but Isaac didn't. And see, here's the thing. In Proverbs 16:7. It says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And this whole thing is exactly what I was telling about that little story. Here was this beautiful man, this very, very wealthy man, this rich young ruler that had come into my space maybe to buy my product. And God said, no, 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 no. That's not what this is about. There are eternal things at stake here. I don't want you to look at what he can do for you. I need you to understand. I need you to bless him. He can't go before the throne of grace. He can't intercede for himself or his son. But you can. You see, we are blessed to be a blessing. God will make us prosperous, not so that we can go on some little flesh trip and just go crazy and be selfish, but God will prosper his people because he has assignments that need to get done, and he can trust us. Isaac began to be prosperous, continued to become prosperous until he became prosperous. So, number one, church, realize that God wants to bless you, give you the power to succeed, 
You're a child of God, an heir of Christ Jesus. You are born in this generation for such a time as this to accomplish God's plans and purposes. You are blessed. God has given you the power to succeed. Number two, do not allow yourself to stay in fear, doubt, and unbelief. If that's where you are, repent. Get out of it. And then get into faith, and faith without works is dead. You're going to have to put your hand to something and do something. Number four, you're going to have to keep doing the right thing the right way for as long as it takes. Because when you begin to be blessed, you're going to have persecution and you're going to have war. But it's how you win that war that will determine how much ground you are going to be able to keep in the kingdom. And number five, when it's all said and done, remember why he's blessed you. Because he needs you to be the blessing. The church is the living and the breathing organism of God on this earth. He's the head, we're the body. All the power of the Godhead has been given to Jesus. All authority has been given unto him. He told us to go, therefore, into all the earth, to preach this gospel, to live this gospel life, to be lights that shine in the darkness, and to put our hand in faith to what God has put in front of us to do. And let's believe God to prosper us and to accomplish the destinies that each one of us have been called to. Did you get something out of tonight? And tonight, before we go, I just want to invite you to be a part if you're not. So many years ago, so many years ago, I got changed and saved and rearranged by Jesus Christ way back in the Jesus movement of the 70s raised in the church but left and said I don't believe any of this stuff and studied world religions and got good and high and sold drugs and went to Germany and brought hash back from Amsterdam and just all kinds of stupid stuff stupid stuff when I got finally messed up enough by the world systems I had enough in me to know that Jesus Christ was who he said he was and my life was a mess and I didn't know if he would ever take me back because I sure didn't deserve him. But I found out that he loved me. He loved me as much when I was tearing papers out of the mother, my mother's Bible because she always slid a Bible in my Volkswagen van and I ran out of you know, papers for joints and I was rolling some joints up in a Bible. We were smoking the word, you know. And, and I realized that God loved me as much then in that absolute foolishness and sin as he does right now at 64 as a pastor's wife serving God all these years he loved me as much then as he loves me now there was no difference and you see maybe some of you in here haven't come home or haven't asked Jesus into your hearts to be your Lord and your Savior because maybe you don't understand so let me just explain just a few things to you very quickly there's only one way to heaven I know we live in a nation of many many religions and we're told that all roads lead to heaven but all roads don't lead to heaven and just because somebody says it doesn't make it true either God is true or he's a liar and this word this Bible has proved itself to be true for millenniums there are more statistics on the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ being able to even happen. All the prophecies that were given over him, over 40 prophecies, all came true. It's an impossible thing, and yet it happened. It's either true or it isn't. He's either the real deal or he's not. And he is. I can tell you he is by testimony and by a changed life. And God said there's only one way to his heaven, because it's his heaven. He's the king. He made it all. There's only one way to his heaven. It's not the way of the Muslims. It's not the way of the Krishnas. It's not the Buddhists. It's not any other world religion. There's only one way. It's God's way. And God says it's a narrow road and there's only one way. And he says you must be born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And born again means that I have looked at that cross and that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, all God and all man, has hung on that cross for me and I believe that he died for me, that he took my sin because I couldn't do anything about it, but he could do everything about it, and that he raised from the dead. 
And when I look to that cross and I believe that, Jesus said at that point in time, when you make a choice in your heart to give him your life, you'll be born again. And he'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness and he'll bring you into the kingdom of light. If you have never made that decision, if you've never made that choice, if you've never said to Jesus Christ, I need you, I believe that you are who you said you are, and I need you to be my Lord and my Savior. If you've never done that, I want to give you an opportunity tonight to get right with God, to come into the kingdom of God and let God change your life from the inside out. That's why he brought you here tonight. It's the best, most amazing news. That's what the gospel means is good news. This is good news that you can't change, but he can change you. That you can't save yourself, but you have a Savior that loves you so much. He loves you in your worst moments. And he'd never tell anybody your worst moments, but he loves you. But he doesn't want you to stay there. Because you can't save yourself. So all over this auditorium, I don't know where you're at tonight. Maybe some of you are really good, better than I ever dreamed of being or ever will be. Because I'm still a little bit of a rascal. Maybe some of you are rascals. You're the ones that have blown it, and you don't even like yourselves, and you don't even trust yourselves. But you know what? You can't save you, but he can. Maybe some of, some of you have, have backslidden, and you said yes to Jesus, but you're here tonight, and you know you need to get right with God. All over this auditorium, have you surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ? Because if you haven't, if you were to close your eyes and walk out those doors tonight in death, listen, you'd find yourself in hell and not heaven, and God didn't make you for hell. He made you for heaven, and he brought you here tonight to change your destiny, just like he changed mine so many years ago. So if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've been a rascal, I'm really talking to you. If you've backslidden, this is your night to get right with God. Now this is how we do it at The Rock, with heads up and eyes open. I'm just gonna clap my hands and I'm just gonna go bang like that. My husband has a much bigger hand, it's much louder, so mine isn't too loud, so you gotta listen. I'll go one, two, three, bang. And we're going to raise our hands all together. We're going to do it all together. If you need to get right with God, if you need to make him Savior and Lord tonight, and you haven't, it's time to get right. He brought you here tonight to change your destiny and to bring you into his kingdom, to be Savior and Lord. If you've backslidden, he's, he's brought you here tonight to get right. So are you ready? All over this auditorium. One, two, three. Let me see your hands all over this auditorium. Raise them high at me because a little eye problem. Everybody's right with God, huh? I don't think so. I see that hand. Come on. I see that hand. Where? There's another hand. I see that hand. Okay, I can't see any hands. But there, everybody's waving that there's hands. Raise them high. Let me see them. But don't be ashamed. He said, if you confess me before men, I see that hand in the family room. Beautiful. I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I see that hand, beautiful. It's only our silly pride. It's only our human stupidity that says, I'm not gonna do this. Why? If he can hang naked on a cross as a spectacle, the Son of God who created everything, you can't say yes to him in the safe place that he brought you here? Are you crazy? Really? He's wonderful. My Jesus is so wonderful. Words can't tell you how incredible he is, how much he loves you to do what he did for us. There's another hand. This is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have Elijah sing this song. We're going to all stand. And if you raised your hand or you didn't and you need to, and you know the Holy Spirit's just all over you, you don't like it, you're nervous, you wish I'd shut up, but I'm not going to. Just stand up, grab the stuff that you brought to church with you, slip out of the aisles, just meet me here, and let's get this done. It's time. That's why you're here tonight. He brought you here. It's time to come home. It's time. So just quickly come. Bring your families, bring friends, whatever you need to bring. Just get down here and get right with God. Quickly come. How can it be that you might king when die for Quickly come. You can't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking the Lord into your heart. 
Jesus, I believe that you're real. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. joy to honor you. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. That's stupid. Listen, if you were in hell, you'd raise anything to get out of hell, even your underwear on a flagpole. Get down here. I honor you in all I do. There's more coming. There's more coming. Listen, I don't want to bully you as a nana into getting saved, okay? I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you, he is the most amazing Savior. I couldn't change me, but he could. Maybe you've walked an aisle too many times and you're just nervous. You know, I didn't trust myself because I said, oh, I believe in Jesus. I'd go to a bar and say, I believe that Jesus is real, but I couldn't live for him. But it wasn't until I really gave him my heart that he changed me and gave me the power to be and to live as a believer. And look at me now. All these years, he hasn't let me go. All these years, you don't know how bad I was. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? He can take the worst of the worst and change us. There's some bad worst you're thinking about yourself tonight you need to get down here I'm just I'm just gonna give you a little bit more time because I know you're in there I can feel the Holy Spirit on you I'm not here to embarrass you I'm not here to make a spectacle of you this is a safe place we've prayed for you we've asked God to bring you we haven't seen your face but oh he's put you on our hearts and he loves you and he wants you to come home so I'd like to just sing it one more time. We're just going to give it one more moment. One more moment. Amazing love. Oh, beloved child. How can it be? There's five of you that need to come. There's five more of you. He's calling home tonight. Where are you, children? waiting for you are worth waiting for oh you're so worth waiting for you're so worth waiting for he doesn't want to do heaven without you okay for the two that didn't come you come back don't be stubborn Listen, we have a saying here, give us a year and your life will completely change. You're not joining a church or a program, you're saying yes to Jesus. So we're going we're gonna to take you into our new believers room. It's a wonderful place, it's beautiful and it's safe and nobody's there. We're just going to pray with you and you're not going to be there for very long. Your family can follow you or they'll wait for you. And this is Pastor Joel, he's awesome. And if you'll just make a left turn and follow him, he's just going to pray with you and give you a Bible. Love you. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. 
I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.